Good morning, friends, and welcome. As we gather on this All Saints Sunday, I invite you now to bow your head with me as we pray. Gracious and living God, we give you thanks for having gathered us together in this moment as we commemorate this All Saint Sunday. Lord, write now your word upon our hearts and our lives, that we too may live faithfully to you in this our generation. We ask and pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, I want to share with you some words from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 3. There Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As I reflected on today's passage of Scripture, in the context of All Saints Day, which we mark on this day, I was reminded of another passage of Scripture which comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 6, a portion of which I used to have as a signature at the end of my emails. The passage of Scripture read as follows, We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing but yet possessing everything. And this passage, of course, it forms a part of Paul's summary of his witness among the Corinthian church, in which he declares that he and his colleagues have lived faithfully among the Corinthian Christians, even though they have endured all of these things, all the afflictions and hardships and calamities and beatings and imprisonments and riots, labors, sleepless nights, even hunger for the sake of the gospel. But I think this passage stood out to me for two important reasons. First, it is a witness to the commitment and to the determination of Paul and his companions to stay the course and to abide in the grace of God and to endure all the tribulations that they would indeed have to endure on account of the hope which had been set before them in this Jesus Christ. Friends, it is a commitment and it is a determination to abide in the grace of God to which all who would follow Christ are called. And that includes you and me. And so the second reason this passage left its mark on my mind is the fact that the true blessedness the true blessedness which marks the way of life of a follower of Christ in this world is for the most part hidden from this very same world, which of course seems ironic at first, since of course our lives are intended to be a kind of witness to this Jesus Christ. But the Christian life, it has a kind of clandestine character to it. Right? We see it throughout the Gospels and even in Jesus' own life, that those among whom he came to preach and teach, they have fully functioning eyes and ears, just like you and I, but yet they cannot perceive the blessedness of this way of life, even as it is set out before them. And so Paul and his fellow workers in the Gospel, they were treated as impostors, as unknown as dying, as punished, as sorrowful, as poor, as having nothing. But they were in truth and in fact true. They were well known. They were deeply alive friends. They were not killed. They were always rejoicing, making many rich and possessing everything. And so therefore, saints are those friends who endure all that comes their way on account of their faithful witness to this Jesus Christ as we live our lives. 
knowing that even though the world may not see it, that the true beauty and happiness of this way of life to which we are called is often hidden. It often goes unnoticed by a world which is by definition unwilling to confess that Jesus Christ is the one who is Lord. And so in our gospel reading for today, Jesus teaches his disciples about the true life of happiness and blessedness, the true life of beatitude. And it is that portion of scripture, which of course is known to us as the Sermon on the Mount. And very much in line with, with Paul's own experiences, of, as we've just heard, in following our Lord and his risen life, this life of beatitude, Right, This life of extreme blessedness and happiness is, in a sense, hidden in plain sight, hidden among the characteristics, hidden among the dispositions and forms of life, friends, where the world would hardly think to look when it tries to find what is true happiness and true blessedness. And so in his sermon, Jesus pronounces eight blessings, Eight kinds of characteristics and, and dispositions among people which appear as though they should be pitiable among the world's standards, but which in fact find great reward in him. But today I just want to draw your attention to the first blessing, because I believe that it is not only the key to understanding the other seven, but it is the seedbed in which these other seven blessings grow. And so Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so the poor in spirit have been paralleled or compared by some to the beggar on the street. Now, Poverty is a reality which is, of course, multifaceted, which is just a fancy way of saying that it has many parts to it. It has many layers, many faces. And so on the surface, the poor may seem to be so because they lack certain basic necessity, certain things that they need for survival. But if you dig a little deeper, we find out that the poor may also experience a kind of deprivation, if you will, whereby they are deprived from having access to certain necessities on account of the very ordering of the social and economic systems of which we are all a part. And so therefore, they are constrained or bound up in certain cycles of poverty. And so when we think of poverty in this way, Right of someone not being able to afford even the very basic necessities in order to live and to survive, we may rightly wonder, we may rightly ask, well, where is the blessedness in any kind of poverty, let alone those who are poor in spirit? How could Jesus say, blessed are those who are poor in spirit? I remember my parents and those of their generation sharing with us about their experiences in growing up as a part of a large family, all living together in very often one-bedroom homes. And so they would say that back then they didn't even know that they were poor because everybody lived in that way, right? They shared everything that they had with one another and they shared with those who did not have. They worked hard, they looked after one another, and they took care of the little that they did have. And the simple point here, friends, is that like the beggar on the street, they simply had no desire for those things that they knew that they were unable to afford. They weren't even on their radar, if you will, right? Even though there were some, I'm sure, in the world at that time who did desire these sort of lavish luxuries. But the desire for such luxuries were not a part of their world. And so in a sense, they were free from such desires. And in a similar way, 
The beggar on the street will not have the desire to go out and to buy the, the hottest tech stock or the hottest pharmaceutical stock, although there are persons in this world which do. Right? It is not a part of their world. It is a desire from which they are free. And so in a similar way, the poor in spirit are those who, on account of their desire to truly follow Christ as Lord, have learned to wear this world very loosely. Over time, they have been trained to desire not what the world desires and not what the world tries to train them to desire, but to desire the things of God. These are the poor in spirit. They really do desire to have the habits and virtues of Christ develop in their own lives. They really do desire to be marked so deeply by the life of the Spirit within their own lives, bearing fruit, so that they may become a loving people, that they may become a joyful people, a patient people, a kind people, people who are generous, people who are faithful, people who are gentle, and people who are self-controlled. They really do want that kind of life. The poor in spirit really do want to be honest about their sin and the sins of those around them. Even if it makes them deeply sad, they want to be honest about these things. They really do want to submit themselves more and more to God, day by day and moment by moment, so that they may see his providence over their lives. They really do want God's grace to flood their souls, transforming them from the inside out. They really do want to live with a spirit of generosity toward their neighbor and a willingness to forgive past offenses, to let those things go. They really do want their hearts to be made pure so that they may truly become more Christ-like in thought, in word, and in deed. They really do, friends, desire to seize the grace of God moment by moment and day by day to confess their sins one to another truly in order to make peace with their brother or sister. For the reality is that in desiring these things, friends, the pure in heart have come to recognize that all the other worldly desires from which they have been set free indeed, that all these other desires are only things that profoundly distort our hearts and our souls. And so they desire to be like God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they have come to recognize their need for God. They have come to desire God above all else. And Jesus says to us today in the scriptures, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so just like Paul and his co-workers in the gospel who were treated as poor but yet possessing everything, the poor in spirit are those who have discovered in Christ that treasure which is hidden in the field, that pearl of great value. And they have done all in their power to lay hold of that grace and to let even their desires be shaped by him. That is what it means to be poor in spirit. And so the question that I want to put to you today is this. What is holding you back this day from yielding yourself more wholeheartedly to God? What have you gone after in this life, but which has in fact taken you far away from God's will for where he wants you to be. Will you let God do his hidden work in your heart and in your life today? You see, Jesus is always beckoning us. He is beckoning you today, my friend, to come and to join this great company of saints, not people who are perfect, but people who are striving to be like him. We are learning what it means, friends, day by day, 
to lay down our lives and to truly trust in him moment by moment because these are the ones who are poor in spirit. We are learning what it means to follow this Jesus Christ as Lord. Will you join the saints in this journey today? Let us pray. O God of all the ages, your saints who live in faithful service around your throne and offer you praise and worship both day and night, glorify you. May we, your saints on earth, join our voices with theirs to proclaim your rule and righteousness and peace, which comes to us through Jesus Christ, both now and forevermore. Amen.